friends, it's me, the Ebony Otaku, the well-rounded nerd. I've really been enjoying doing the readings um, from various Warhammer books and some other uh, media, so I think I'll continue doing that, obviously. Um, I meant to do a recording specifically for Halloween, uh, but uh, I had some things come up and it didn't happen, so I'm going to do that today. Uh, but I thought for this one, for the first time, I might need to do a bit of a, um, what are they called, a uh, trigger warning? Because um, we're, we're going to be reading from Fulgrim. And if you are familiar with the Horse Heresy, not just the Horse Heresy, but the entire Warhammer series, while one of the things I love about military sci-fi, and specifically the Black Library, is that they leave out... Um, smuttiness <laughs> I guess that's what I would say um, they are very descriptive as to the effects of certain things and when um, whether it's human Astartes whoever start getting involved with chaos and rune powers and the rest of it uh, it corrupts and the authors are very good at describing that corruption and um, Gets a little, gets a little extra <laughs> in some places. Uh, nothing super awful, but I just thought I'd let you know before you listened to this. Now, all that being said, um, as a person who loves all things nerdy and being a uh, well-rounded nerd, those are dog hairs, by the way, on my microphone. Someone's going to say something. Look, I have a dog who sheds his hairs everywhere. I vacuum every day. He doesn't care. He gets paid for hair. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, I love all kinds of storytelling media. And sometimes when you get the full grasp of the story, you got to go there. And they go there in the full grown, especially in the parts <laughs> that I'm going to read today. So no judgment on the media that you like. Um, hey, y'all, I've, I've not hidden the fact that I am a, a Christian and a Baptist. Uh, and there are some parts of the Bible where it's like, hmm, there's a reason you don't tell eight-year-olds to read the entire Bible. They will have questions. That's how I know adults haven't read it. Anyway, that's a whole other thing. Uh, but I, I gave my warning. I'm still going to read it, and we're all going to enjoy it. So uh, let's dig in, dig in. World of Beth. The Trap is Set. Mara Viglia from chapter 22 of Fulgrim Visions of Treachery by Graham McNeil Enjoy Julius watched with barely contained excitement as the blue-haired composer crossed the stage and descended into the orchestra pit to take her place on the conductor's podium. Dressed in a scandalously translucent dress of gold and crimson, the gossamer thin material hung with precious stones that glittered like stars. The cut of her tress plunged from her shoulders to her pelvis. The swell of her breast and the hairlessness of her flesh clearly visible beneath. Magnificent! cried Fulgrim, clapping furiously with the audience as Bakewa's appearance. And Julius was amazed to see tears in his eyes. Julius nodded, and though he had no real memory of feminine splendor or any frame of reference against which to compare her, the composer's curves and obvious womanhood stole away his breath. Julius had felt such stirrings of emotion when he gazed upon his primarch. He heard a particularly inspiring piece of music or when he went into battle, but to feel his senses aroused by a mortal woman was a new experience for him. 
thick silence enveloped the audience as they waited for the magic to happen. The collective breath of nearly 10,000 throats held fast as the moment of anticipation stretched to breaking point. Bakwa selected a Mingmo baton and tapped it on the libretto stand before launching into the opening bars of the Maribaguas overture. Tremendous noise erupted from the orchestra pit as the first notes blared from the newly conceived musical devices. The sound reaching to every corner of La Fenice with its wonderful instrumentation, romantic beauty, and hints of themes yet to come. Julius felt himself carried on a journey of the senses as the music rose and fell, emotions he had never experienced, plucked from the depths of his soul and brought joyously to the fore as the crashing beat and wild skirling tunes wound their way through the audience. He wanted to laugh and then cry, and then he felt a terrible anger build before it bled away and a great melancholy settled upon him. Within moments, the music had torn that loose and a soaring elation asserted itself with the utmost lucidity and force, as though all that had gone before was merely the prelude to some grand design yet to be unveiled. Bekwa Kinska thrashed like a lunatic atop her conductor's podium, jabbing and slashing the air with her baton, her hair a wild comet of blue as it whipped around her head. Julius tore his eyes from the magnificent sight of her and looked out over the audience to witness its reaction to this sublime, raucous music. He saw faces wrapped in stunned disbelief, eyes wide as the power and majesty of the dissonant sounds penetrated every skull and spoke to every soul of sensations it evoked. But not every member of the audience appeared to appreciate the wonder, the privilege of what they witnessed. And Julius saw many with their hands clamped over their ears in throes of agony as the music swelled once more. Julius caught sight of a slender figure of Evander Tobias in the audience, and his anger grew as he watched the ungrateful wretch lead a group of his fellow scriveners through the crowd towards the exit. Scuffles broke out as the recreant archivist and his fellows were attacked, fist pummeling them to the ground where they were kicked and beaten. Without pause, the audience returned its attention to the stage, and Julius felt a fierce pride swell in his breast as he watched a heavy boot crunch down on Tobias's skull. None remarked upon the sudden bloody violence as if it had been the most natural reaction. But Julius could see the bloodlust spread throughout the audience like a virus or the shockwave of a detonation. The music swept onwards, rising and sweeping around La Fenice like a whirlwind, until at last it reached the thunderous crescendo of its climax whereupon the curtain rose in a flurry of dramatic and spectacular sensations. Julius rose to his feet as the peals of music drove ever onward. The overture continued an unbroken melody of sounds and the sheer visceral emotions that filled him on seeing what lay beyond was like a punch to his guts. The interior of the Lair Temple had been recreated in painstaking detail its eye-watering colors and dimensions faithfully recreated by the artist and the sculptors who had walked within its magnificence. Vivid lights flashed around the theater and Julius felt a momentary disorientation as more music blasted from the orchestra 
a new piece with darker overtones and an inking sense of imminent tragedy. The waves of sound and harmony flowed outwards from the stage and over the audience, immersing them in the power and sensations he had felt when he had followed Fulgrim into the temple. The effect was immediately obvious, and a shudder of pleasure rippled through the audience as the powerful notes flowed into and through them. Dizzying colors flashed through the air as the music built to yet another high. A second spotlight stabbed the stage. The slender form of Coraline Seneca, the prima donna of the Maraviglia, appeared. Julius had never heard Coraline's voice before and was unprepared for the sheer virtuosity and power of her singing. Her tone was in perfect, discordant harmony with Bakewood's music, reaching heights no human voice could possibly attain, yet attain them she did. The energy of her soprano's voice reaching beyond the realms of the five senses, all of which were being stimulated, it seemed, to Julius. He leaned forwards, laughing uncontrollably as an intoxicating rush of emotion seized him, and he clasped his hands to his head at such an over-stimulation. A chorus joined Coraline a Seneca on the stage, though Julius hardly noticed them, their intermingled voices allowing the soprano's voice to swoop through even more unfeasible notes, which reached into the very hindbrain to pluck at the sensory apparatus Julius was not even aware he possessed. Julius forced himself to look away from the stage. Enthralled and terrified, of what he was seeing. What manner of being could hear music of such terrible power and retain his sanity? Man was not meant to listen to this. The birthing cry of a beautiful and terrible god as it forced its way into existence. Eidolon and Marius were ensnared by the spectacle of the Maraviglia as he was, pinned to their seats in raptures. The jaws of both warriors were rocked open as though they entertained the idea of joining Coraline a Seneca in a song. But there was panic in their eyes as their mouths stretch wide in silent screams. Bones cracking as they distended like a snake to devour its prey. Hideous, soundless shrieks issued from their throats, and Julius forced himself to look at Fulgrim for fear that he might strike down his friends in his fugue state. Fulgrim gripped the edge of the Phoenician's nest, leaning forward as though forcing passage through a powerful wind. His hair writhed around his head and his dark eyes burned with a violent fire as he reveled in the cacophony. What is happening? cried Julius, his voice swept up and becoming part of the music. Fulgrim turned his dark eyes upon him, and Julius cried out as he saw an age of darkness within them, galaxies and stars wheeling in their depths as unknown power flowed through him. It's beautiful, said Fulgrim his voice barely above a whisper. 
but sounding deafening to Julius as he propelled himself from his seat and fell to his knees at the edge of the box. Horace spoke power. But I never imagined. Julius watched in wonder, realizing that he could actually see the soprano's music as it reached out into the audience and slithered among them like a living thing. Their shrieks and cries penetrated the fog of music that writhed in his brain, and he saw all manner of horrors enacted throughout the audience as friends turned and fought each other with fist and teeth. Some audience members fell upon one another with carnal lust, and heaving crowds soon resembled a great wounded beast convulsing in agonized throes of death and desire. Nor was it simply mortals who were affected. The Astartes, too, were swept up in the surging power generated by the Maraviglia. Blood was spilled as the emotions of the Astartes were overloaded with sensational excesses and were bented in the only way men bred as warriors knew how. An orgy of killing spread from the stage, blood running in rivers as the power of the music thundered through Lothanis. Julius heard a great buzzing and creaking sound like a great sheet of sailcloth being ripped to shreds, and he turned to see the mighty portrait of Fulgrim writhing and stretching at the canvas as though its painted subject fought to be free from the constraints of the frame. Fires blazed in its eyes, and a howling shriek that sounded as though it echoed down the impossibly long tunnel filled with skull and monstrous thirst and a promise of horrific splendors. Lights blazed around the theater, flowing from the orchestra pit like liquid, the greasy electrical fire lifting from the bizarre instruments and achieving physicality as they became liquid serpents of myriad colors. Madness and excess followed the light, and all those it touched gave themselves over to the wildest, darkest delights of their inner psyche. The orchestra played as though their limbs were not their own, their faces twisted in horrified rictus masks, and their hands frenziedly dancing across their instruments with violent life. The music held them in its grip. It was not about to let any weakness on the part of its creators deny its existence. Julius heard notes of agony enter Coraline, a Seneca's voice, where the prima donna danced in a wild, exuberant ballet, and the chorister screamed in a natural counterpoint. Her limbs snapped and twisted in a manner no human limb was designed to, and he could hear the cracking of her bones as it became part of the million melodies filling the theater. He could see that she was dead, her eyes lifeless. Every bone in her body turned song poured from her still. The madness and frenzy engulfing Lothany soared to new heights of excess as all flesh was infected with the maelstrom of sights and sounds coming from the stage. Julius watched as Astartes clubbed mortals to death with their fists and drank their blood or ate their flesh, scarring their skin with the broken bones and draping the torn skin of their victims about them in grisly shawls. Vast orgies of mortals shuddered on the blood-slit parquet as the living and the dead became vessels for the dark energies pouring into the world. Every violation imaginable was inflicted. At the center of the madness, 
Bekwa Kinska conducted the chaos with a delirious smile of triumph plastered across her face. Julia saw the knowledge that this was her greatest work in the light of her eyes as she stared in rapt adoration at full grown. Then, without warning, a terrifying scream cut through the crescendo of noise and Julius saw the abused form of Coraline as Seneca twist into the air, her limbs spread eagle as some unknown power seized the broken meat and gristle of her body and wrapped it into some new hideous form. Her shattered limbs straightened, becoming lithe and graceful once again, the flesh taking on a pale lilac hue, where before Coraline had been clad in a shimmering dress of blue silk, the fabric transformed into a harness of green black level, revealed the supple beauty of the soft flesh formed from the ruin of her corpse. A horrific wet sucking noise engulfed the prima donna, and whatever force had previously held her aloft released her. The thing, Coraline as Seneca had become, landed with supple grace in the center of the stage. Julius had never seen anything so simultaneously beautiful and repellent. A naked female creature that evoked both potent loathing and perverse sensuality that gnawed at the pit of his stomach. Hair like needle horns swept back from her oval face with its green saucer like eyes, fanged mouth, and luscious lips. Her body was sculpted perfection, wide and sensuous, but with only a single breast, and her skin was loathsomely tattooed and pierced. Each of her arms terminated in a long crab like of glistening red chitin and moist fess. Despite the lethal claws, the creature was disturbingly seductive, and Julius felt moved in a way he had not been since he had been elevated to the ranks of the Astaches. She moved with languid cat-like grace, her every movement reticent with sexuality and the promise of dark pleasures and excess unknown to the minds of mortal men. Julius ached to taste them. The she-creature turned her ancient eyes upon the choristers behind her and threw her head back to emit a siren song of such longing and heartbreaking beauty that Julius wanted to climb from the box to join her. Even before the note of summoning had dissipated, it was taken up by the frenzied orchestra and grew louder and louder. Julius saw the members of the chorus spasm and twist as Coraline as Seneca had, the same bone-cracking harmonies transforming five of them into more hauntingly alluring creatures. The remaining choristers fell to the stage as dry husk flesh, drained of their life as though merely fuel to the power of the transformation of the cloying creatures that leapt from the stage in a flurry of slicing claws and bestial streaks. The six creatures moved with sinewy, supple grace, the caress of their razor-sharp claws opening arteries and severing limbs with every lissom movement. Beko Kinska first to die. A monstrous claw impaling her from behind and ripping from her chest in a fountain of blood. And even as she died, she smiled in delight at the wondrous things that she had done. The rest of the orchestra was torn to pieces as the beautiful monsters ripped through them with speed and sensual malice that Julius could barely imagine. Last, the music of the Maraviglia fell silent as the musicians were slaughtered in the caress of razor claws. 
their lives torn from their quivering flesh. Julius cried out in a sudden fury. The absence of the music felt like a physical pain in his bones. But the music had fallen silent. La Fenice was still a deafening arena. The killing and population continued unabated, though the shrieks of agony and ecstasy turned to wails of anguish as the music demise was mourned in renewed bouts of bloody madness. Julius heard Marius give a howling cry of loss, and he turned to see his battle brother leap from the Phoenician's nest to the stage. Fulgrim watched him go, his body quivering with emotion and pleasure, and Julius pushed himself unsteadily to his feet. He watched as Marius dropped onto the bloody ruin in the orchestra pit and lifted one of Bekla Kinska's bizarre instruments. Marius hefted the long tubular device and hooked the crook of his arm around it like a bolt gun, running his hand along the length of the shaft until it produced a monstrous vibration like the roar of a chain sword. Even as Julius watched Marius's futile attempts to recreate the music, more of the emperor's children rushed to join him, each picking up one of the orchestral instruments and attempting to conjure the magic of the music once more. Julius felt the breath heave in his lungs and gripped the edge of the balcony for fear that his legs would not support him. I... What? Was all he could manage as Fulgrim was moved to stand next to him. Wondrous, was it not? Asked Fulgrim his skin glowing with renewed vigor as his eyes alight with fresh purpose. Mistress Kinska was a fiery comet. Everyone stopped to look at her, and now she is gone. We will never see anything like her again. None of us will be able to forget her. Julius tried to reply, but a vast explosion of noise erupted from behind him, and he turned to see a portion of the stage wreathed in smoke and collapsing rubble. Marius stood in the center of the orchestra pit, electrical fire dancing across his flesh as he stumbled his hands across the screaming instrument. A howling Prophetic blast of sonic energy shot from it and ripped one of the balconies from its wall in a devastating explosion. Chunks of marble and plaster flew through the air. The sound of the instrument drew howls of pleasure from Marius's fellow Astartes. Within moments, each had mastered his device and a renewed crescendo of howling, shrieking, and blast of energy began ripping the theater apart. The monstrously beguiling she-monsters gathered around Marius, adding their own unnatural shrieks of pleasure to the delirious music he was making. Marius turned his instrument into the crowd and unleashed a thrumming bass note that built to an explosive climax. Clashing chords like howls of ecstasy tore through a dozen mortals with an ear-splitting concussion, and each of Marius's victims thrashed helplessly as their bones snapped and their heads exploded beneath the barrage of noise. My emperor's children, said Fulgrim. What sweet music they make. Explosions of flesh and stone boomed throughout La Fenice as Marius and the rest of the Astartes filled La Fenice with the music of the apocalypse. Yeah, I told y'all that was going to be one. <laughs> it, it, um, but stories like this are important because they are cautionary. 
Um, I love the way the writers of the Black Library describe things like this because it's a warning against indulging in excess. When you truly give yourself over to a life of excess, whatever that excess is, it consumes you and ultimately causes one's demise. And one can't distinguish between pleasure and pain after a certain point. And when people get to that point, that's when we consider them truly lost. Um, so if you've not read uh, much of the Warhammer universe, this is the, literally the moment where Fulgrim's Legion, the Emperor's Children, ironically, um, they named themselves to literally be the most beautiful thing that the Emperor had created. The most beautiful creation of the Emperor became the most twisted and perverse. It definitely mirrors uh, the story of creation, what God created to be beautiful and perfect. And Lucifer, the most beautiful angel in heaven, turned against God because Lucifer wanted to be God. Fulgrim wants to be something greater than the emperor, which is why he seeks out on the quest, if you saw that bit of foreshadowing in there, to become the angel exterminatus so that he can be greater than his genie father. Lucifer sought to be greater than God, thus was cast out as a demon and became, you know, basically the, the leader of um, those that fell with him. About a third of the angels fell from heaven with Lucifer. Um, to become what we call today, you know, demons and, and whatnot. Um, so it's a very good parallel story of learning because to seek to become what you were never meant to be, even if it comes with temporary great power and pleasure, it can ultimately destroy you. Because as a reader looking at this, it's like, whoa, that's horrifying. But while people are in the middle of their whatever it is, they don't realize how awful it really is like addicts, someone who has hoarding disorder, um, a person lost uh, to shopping addiction or food addiction. When people get lost in their addictions and pleasures and we watch these shows and go, how do they not know that this is abnormal? They don't because they're so far into them and so consumed that it has become their identity. And to separate them from what has become their identity oftentimes causes greater pain or even the last days of their life. You know, we see it all the time on, you know, certain types of programming where people go through these extreme changes oftentimes against their will, but they end up either reverting back or their life comes to an unfortunate end. Um, I think Fulgrim is the greatest so far from what I've read because there's so many books in the Horus Heresy. I have not read them all. I'm working on it. Um, but I think Fulgrim is one of the greatest cautionary tales in um, the entire series. If you choose to give yourself over, and it was a choice that Fulgrim made, if you choose to give yourself over to the darkness, the darkness will happily accept you and consume you. And you won't realize what you've become. Even if good tries to save you, there comes a point where we are beyond, beyond saving. So, um, yeah, that was the story. So please like, comment, and subscribe. I am still doing my little contest. Thank you to everyone who has newly subscribed. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the story. I warned you it was, it was going to be one. I didn't lie. I seen the lies. <laughs> so uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I'll definitely uh, be reading more, not just for Warhammer. I'm just really enjoying this right now because um, you, you can be so expressive with Warhammer. But I'm, I am actually creeping toward that 500 mark. I'm not so sure that I'm going to um, include Twitter anymore, just the Instagrams and the YouTubes to get 500 followers on each of those, only because I don't really do much with Twitter. Like all it is is a copy of my Instagram and everyone I know who's deep into Twitter is deep into drama and I'm, I'll watch other people's drama. I don't want to be in it. <laughs> and Twitter just seems like a place where only drama happens. So I'm rethinking the Twitter portion, but yeah. So see you all in the next one. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like, comment, and subscribe. I've seen some suggestions on things to read next. I'm looking for them in the books they're located in. Uh, if you have any more suggestions or other sci-fi series, uh, let me know and we will add that to the uh, list. See you in the next one.